Hello, am I live? Can you hear me? Cool. Um, first up, thank you very much to Luis and to everyone at YLD and Make Us Proud and London Digital Product for the invitation to speak. And very much thanks to all of you for your kind attendance and attention tonight. Um, I really appreciate it. I always really appreciate the opportunity to get up and speak. This is a high level overview of my company Tito with respect to how we build customer happiness with a very small team. Um, it's a 10,000 foot look at what we do. I don't go into extreme detail in anything. So hopefully you'll find it a little bit useful just to see how we manage a growing company with a very small team. My name is Paul. I'm from Ireland but I'm currently living in Hertfordshire, so um, I'm a little bit local to London, but I'm normally based in Dublin. I'll probably be returning back to Dublin next year, and the office of Tito is in Dublin, our, little, our new HQ. Tito is a web app. It's for selling tickets online, and you may have used it to buy uh, tickets for events or conferences around the world. It's primarily for tech events, so it suits the audience, and customers like Mozilla here in London use it for their festivals, the Lead Developer Conference, JSConf, RubyConf, Strange Loop. We have customers like Intercom, SaaStock, Shopify, and, and loads of others. So um, we're really proud of our customer base, particularly since we're in entirely independent ourselves. So I want to talk about our approach to customer happiness. And customer happiness is basically the fundamental view that we take of success. So success to us is a happy customer and happy customers. And so we feel that that's a universal truth of, of doing business. And so customer happiness is, we, we try to look at it from not just the product point of view, but from the whole company point of view. So customer happiness to us, it's not just about great customer support, although great customer support is something that we believe very strongly in. But the point is that we want to optimize the whole company for a great experience. And so I want to give an overview of all of the things we do to try and provide a great customer experience throughout the whole company. Um, great, or great experience to me is like the ideal of the happy customer. Um, and so that's our goal with, with the business. The other thing I want to sort of highlight is that we do have a high level of customer happiness at Tito and we do work really hard on it, but we, work, we do it with a very small team. So I'll just talk a little bit about the challenges and the benefits of providing a great customer experience with a small team. So, of course, if you haven't heard of Tito, then, and, or if you aren't familiar with where we're at, um, I've just got a few stats and figures just to provide a little basis for where I'm coming from um, when I'm showing you all the different things we do and why we do it. So Tito, it's a small business, definitely small, but it's not tiny. Um, this is our fourth year as a business, but it's a little bit murky about when we actually started. First line of code was 2011. It was a side project for an event that I was running then. The first customer was 2013, but we didn't incorporate as a business until 2015. So it's really, really slow growth over that, over that time. But in that time, we've processed about $220 million worth of tickets. Um, and at the moment, we're averaging about 200,000 a day during the week. Uh, weekends are completely dead. It's give or take. Some days are bigger and some days are, are smaller, never a whole lot smaller. Um, in and around 2,000 customers, over 60 countries all over the world, um, about 1,600 people logging in every day. Um, and we've had about 13,500 users in, in the last while. So the numbers are, are there and they're about okay. They're not mega, but it's not tiny. So it's, it's a solid little, little business. 400 tickets, given, give or take any day, there's about 400 events on sale. Um, and we're well over a million tickets issued. We did a review a few months ago and we asked people to fill in a five-star review. Um, perhaps we should have done Net Promoter, we might but that was the average score across 40, 45 customers. And that, we thought that was pretty good. 
Um, it's not a huge, again, we're, because our numbers aren't huge, everything isn't, nothing is huge, and so the, all of our data is a little bit like, is it actually true? But we're, we were happy enough with that. And this is typical of the kind of feedback we get from our customers' customers, as well as our customers. Um, I love buying tickets on Tito so much that I'd almost go back and buy a second just for the experience. So like, it, it, it's really, really empowering to, to build something um, based on, what I, on the principles that I'm going to talk about and then feel really justified in the kind of feedback that people give us. Um, we're entirely self-funded. We make money by taking a fee for every ticket. Uh, we make money by offering support um, and we get, um, we get a little bit, we do a little bit of design consultancy as well for our customers. Um, the fee is very small, it's a very, very small percentage of the 220 million. We don't see most, the vast, vast majority of that money. Um, it's a small amount but, and cash flow is very tight. Um, but we have done a very, very small private sale of shares recently. Um, on, on really, really beneficial terms to us. It's, it's absolutely not institutional and it's, there's, there's no venture capitalists in sight. Um, the team size is four. So Doc and myself, Paul, are the co-founders uh, and Carl and Killian are what we call key employees and they've made up the, the, the team for the last year, like tr throughout the, basically the, the lifetime of the, the corporate Team Tito Limited entity is a team of four. Uh, we're just about to grow to a team of six, it's still a few months away, um, and that will be adding Maria and Annie to our marketing team, which didn't exist before. So that's an overview of what the team looks like and what we all do. Um, Doc and I are the founders, and we basically lead engineering and design. Um, anything related to the business, literally anything, I have had my greasy fingers on. Um, and. Doc basically has managed all of the operations and it's really we both manage most of those kind of things. Killian is the other lead engineer on the project. He does solely engineering. Um, Carl, we, got, we, we hired about 18 months ago to head up sales and marketing um, and he basically took a huge amount of pressure off Doc and I in terms of taking sales calls, pursuing leads, contacting inbounds, all that kind of thing. Um, and we never had a marketing, we never did any marketing until the last few months where Maria and Annie have been building a marketing program for us that we haven't launched yet. And then to summarize what I just went through, it's a, it is small but we're, we're growing. Um, we've got a few customers, not in loads, but it's good. Um, people seem to be happy with the product. It's a small team, but growing as well. And our pride and joy, um, we suffered three years in a really small, stinky basement, and we have a lovely new office in the center of Dublin now. So, how did we get to where we are, and whether, whether what I've just described is desirable or not, I'll just describe how we ended up there. And the first thing I want to say about it, and it could possibly be the last thing to say, is that it's just, it just it wasn't easy. So whether or not what I just said was good or bad, it was really, 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 really hard to get there. Um, making sure we were able to keep every, our customers happy to maintain those customer satisfaction uh, and still attempting to grow to take all those sales calls. When we hired Carl, we had no idea if we could afford him or not. It was such a risk. It was a three month probation um, and it worked out, but we just we didn't know where the cash was gonna come from. Um, our ambitions, we want to build every single feature we can, we want to grow at lightning pace, but of course since we don't have the cash flow to do it, we can't spend money because we're just trying to keep ourselves alive whilst we're doing it. And all the time customers need support and some customers are small and they need loads of support and some customers are big or some customers need loads of support before they even start selling or generating cash. So it's a constant battle of time versus cash flow and ambition versus cash flow. This is something I've been feeling lately and it goes up and down. It's the classic roller coaster, but stress levels can be high, particularly even though it, things don't always feel urgent and there's a classic bootstrapper dilemma that if you don't have investors or shareholders or anyone snapping at your heels that you can kind of things can can get a little bit too relaxed. But 
that causes a, a paradoxical stress in itself where you're feeling stressed because you're not acting fast enough. Um, stress, latent stress, lots of head colds and late nights worrying. Uh, you feel it in the shoulders all the time. Sometimes I get snappy or I just snap at co-founder or my wife or anything like Dealing with the stress of running this company is only something in the last few months after six years that I'm starting to accept as a real thing and I'm starting to sort of feel like I should give myself a break on. I'm just about at the tip of feeling like it's going to have been worth it, but damn, it is so real. But despite the cash flow issues and despite the challenges and despite the hardship and despite the fact that it has been really hard we do model through and we're able to run a business and get a business through. So I'll go briefly through the challenges of doing it as a small team and then some benefits and then some philosophy. So the challenges are there's lots of jobs. Um, you have to run a business alongside building a product. Cash is tight and really it all comes down to um, discipline and constantly focusing on what the next most important thing is to get to, the, to where you want to be, which is as many happy customers as possible. Um, the benefits of being a small team are pretty clear to me. Um, decision making is super fast because communication is very direct. When there's only four of us, typically only one or two of us is involved in making a decision. One or the other can just okay it or second it and we can move really quickly. And that's been really helpful. Uh, four people don't cause as many as 400 people. That's simple maths. Um, the next one is either a benefit or a challenge. We take everything so personally. And until the point that we were able to cover basic salaries for everybody, we took things really personally because if a customer chose a competitor instead of us, that could have been the difference between making cash, cash flow that month. So things are really personal, which is both good because you can take pride in every single thing that we add or every single nice thing that's said, but it's also, it can be dangerous because you can kind of go back into that stress or it, it can cause issues. Um, but probably the number one benefit of being a small team is that you have direct communication with customers. So if a customer needs something, they're talking directly with the people who build the tool, um, not going through any layers of account management or anything. And that is a huge benefit for customers and for people using the tool. So the philosophy of how we get there. So I said that customer support isn't enough. So what is it? So I think a great customer experience is based from the ground up, based from the attitude that you kind of get up in the morning and you believe that you want to make customers happy. It goes through the product, through every layer of the whole business, um, and we just build it in to our attitude and our approach to business and building a product. The fundamentals there are basically that we care. So the attitude to providing a great customer experience is as customers of many products ourselves, and I'll show some of those at the end quickly, <laughs> um, we, want to, we know how we want to be treated by other people building, building products. So we try and be the product owners that we want to work with or that we would want to be selling to us. How would we want to be treated ourselves? And so it starts with empathy. So putting ourselves in our customers' shoes and saying, how do we want to make them feel? And that is always, it's a very simple answer. We want to make them feel awesome. But it's about providing that personal connection and again, being small. And because we're the ones that build a product or whatever, we can do that in the, in the customer, um, customer support side of things, but also in terms of building the tool. Um, it's not just a job. So it's about caring. So, we basically put ourselves in, in our customers' shoes and the resounding message, and I think that we hear this a lot of the time, is that we really, really care about solving problems because it's not just a job to us. And so to summarize, we care a lot about what we do. We care about the product, we care about the business, we care about our customer, our, sorry, our employee happiness, we care about customer happiness, and then that basically informs the whole business. Um, having empathy with our customers is key, and it's not just a job we're there building something that we really, really want to build. Final piece of the puzzle then is what do we do putting all the philosophy together to actually build a tool? Super high level, um, but there's a few points. Um, first step 
is an attention to design, um, which I mean is, is fundamental and is, I think a lot of people agree is, is really, really important, um, very difficult with a small team. The second point to me, which I think is really important, and maybe some people overlook, is putting the same attention to detail that you would into a design or user interface or a user flow into building infrastructure. I think that a, a solid infrastructure is critical for customer happiness and building trust. Um, the next step is to use tools. Everybody loves the latest SaaS of the month and we're no different. Um, and then tying it all together with customer support and allowing customer support to fill in the gaps. Design is probably the hardest part of everything I've just described because design is, is so, so, so difficult to get right. Every single element on a screen can be iterated a hundred and thousands of times and it'll never be right. But caring about design is a lot easier than actually design itself. And fundamental to our philosophy is caring. And as long as we care about design, as long as we always feel like we're going in the right direction, we feel like we're succeeding at design. And so that demands iteration. Always constantly tweaking, changing, but not changing for its own sake. Always trying to get better, always trying to move forward. Um, but also bringing empathy into it, not too fast, not distracting the user, not, not messing things up for the same forward. But just always trying to think about moving the product forward because the product itself is at the heart and it's definitely the design that informs the product. So, well, I, I mean, I think that's probably the fundamental point of what I want to get across is that we do believe in a great product. Um, but it's really, really, really hard to do a great product with a small team because there's always so much more to do. Um, but that doesn't stop us from having hugely big ambitions like and taking all the great uh, products that rep or rep represent companies that represent great design as heroes. Um, so we do what we can. We try new things, we experiment, um, and we maintain the focus. Um, here's just a sample of our UI, be it what it is. Uh, this is what the admin UI looks like. Um, the, my, whatever about the visual design of this, my favorite thing about this screen is that there's one big button to push. There's no options, there's no clutter. Um, and then this is a whole new UI that we're working on that I feel summarizes what I just described. It's new, but it's the same. So it's, it's going to be a progress without uh, disorienting people. Instruction infrastructure, I'm going to fly through, um, but it's really close to my heart. Um, we're built entirely on open source, which I think a lot of us are too. Um, we automate a lot of stuff. Our entire stack runs on Amazon. If a machine goes down, it'll be brought back up automatically. Um, if if we do a deploy, it's all completely automated. If we want to add new servers, it can be all automated and timed, and we can set little periods where we add more servers. Everything is automated, and that's how we're able to do things. Uh, we run two instances of every single piece of the stack, um, load balancing, app servers, processing servers, caches, just to make sure that there's redundancy in the event of a failure, and it's all automated. Um, everything is tested. Uh, we have a pretty robust set of integration tests. Uh, particularly around the checkout and most of the time we're able to pick up bugs before they reach customers um, and we do a lot of load testing too um, but the other way we pick up bugs is by having really 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 long beta periods um, some of our beta, beta features have been in beta for two or three years and we still haven't shipped them because we're not super happy with how they work but it allows us to push out new functionality um, disclaimed so that's really cool and then um, outsourcing everything like there, we don't there's not a single one of us has any DevOps uh, credentials whatsoever. So everything gets outsourced to third-party tools and services, mostly AWS, but other things like Fastly for our CDN and uh, Heroku uh, is amazing and we use that. So here's a real quick look at our infrastructure. We're using Aurora and uh, it's, I mean, it's not really, the details aren't, don't matter there, um, but that's our, our stack. It's familiar to some people or whatever. Um, Here's what OpsWorks looks like. We've got load balancers and we've got servers running and backup servers that we can bring up at any point. Um, just to give a kind of a, a, a sense of things. Our uptime is pretty good. It's pretty good. That was for that little period up to, um, last year. It's about, it averaged about 99.95 is, is the worst that we get. Uh, I think it's pretty good for such a small team. 
um, and then Heroku is always building these amazing tools that help things. We don't have a huge amount of stuff in production in Heroku, but it is really helpful for um, iterating on new stuff. Uh, everything gets piped into Slack. That's some, some Twitter. Um, and I'll just fly through some tools, what we use. Um, again, this stuff isn't really as important as what I've already talked about, the philosophy and the approach. Um, but just for interest's sake, we do use Intercom. They're amazing. Um, we also use Help Scout a little bit for, for, for mail, but it's, it's, everything goes through Intercom. Um, and then everything goes through Slack, even Intercom that goes through Slack as well. So um, every single little third-party service has a Slack channel. Um, we use Excel for doing feature planning. We've got a big Excel sheet with little priorities and, and, and scores for every single new feature. And we just rank that and it's dead simple. And then we fire into Pivotal Tracker. We're in kind of a weird state of flux at the moment where we're not actively building um, on new features because we're working on loads of new stuff, but those are the tools we're using. Um, again, secondary, and that's just a little uh, summary of the, the bits and pieces that we use. Um, the, the main, I guess, fundament to why Intercom I think is so successful is because it emphasizes what I talked about earlier, that personal approach. It makes everything personal. Um, I don't know how well it'll scale later, and I think it'll scale well, but for a small team it's, it's the bee's knees, obviously. Here's a little sample of what our Intercom looks like. Um, Again, this is, well, this is actually just to highlight, we have a separate Slack for our customers. There's about 150 customers in a completely separate Slack, uh, which is really good. It's surprisingly quiet and easy to manage, but the customers who are in there really, really, really feel looked after and they have direct, even more direct. So I don't know if you've had that idea, but we find it really useful to, to uh, communicate directly with a, a core, like a, a subset of customers. That's that Excel sheet I talked about, um, dead simple, and it just means that we can rank based on business value and, and uh, complexity, and then we get our list of features to work on. And we shipped, we, we shipped a bunch of the stuff in the top, which was really useful. Pivotal Tracker. And then finally, I thought it was interesting just to show how we make more money in addition to fees, which is basically, by, well, there, yeah, that's definitely true. However, um, it's just this, sample, which might be interesting to folks, of um, please feel free to steal this, but it's just, we've, we found it very good and, and the people who sign up to the, the pro offerings, it's just, it's great for cash flow and then people can get peace of mind for uh, response times and then we do it like these one-off design services for folks. And so that's the end. Um, small is beautiful, I think, but it's really hard. Um, personal, caring, service, grounded in empathy. Um, obviously having a lot of control is cool, but the trade-off is stress. Um, we're not, when people love that we're not a corporation, we, we've got very strong personal values. And at the end of the day, it's pretty cool to build a thing and people use it to do millions and millions and millions of dollars of commerce. Is the Irish for thank you. It's pronounced Gurmila Mahagwev. <laughs>